the seminary, in lectures on the spiritual life. Lecture 5. Power to do good. Subtopic 1 continued, the fruit of the Spirit, and subtopic 2, the gifts of the Spirit. Wash away my sins. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Come on that a little later 
in this course, and I'm not going to I'm not going to anticipate it now in any fullness. Paul said, My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Now the Spirit may use the, the faculty of conscience. That strange thing. One of the strangest uh, aspects of your being. Ability that you have to sit in judgment on yourself as conscience does, that's a most remarkable thing that man should sit in judgment on himself as he does. And there are all kinds of efforts to define what conscience is. There are those that claim that it's nothing in the world but a, but a tendency due to training that we are trained as children to despise evil and to accept the good. But uh, the test of that is to go to a field where there are heathen children to whom no good thing has ever come and nothing but evil and find out from them whether they have a conscience or not. I've sought to conference with missionaries returned from the field to try to find out this and I haven't found out very clearly from them. They don't seem to observe very much about it. There is an awful depression that rests upon the heart of man. The moment that he is under conviction of the spirit Um, David liked it to the drought of summer. The hand of God was heavy upon him night and day, and the drought of summer, and all his moisture was withdrawn. It's a very serious thing. Now, let's go on with the lesson this morning. This time I will have... <coughs> on page 215 we have the gifts of the spirit before I turn to that however I would like to continue just a word on what we had in the last lesson concerning the fruit of the spirit we have nine particular graces that are constituted one fruit in the singular, one fruit, and because they're not divisible, you can't have one and not have the others. So far as I know, it's the work and thought plan of the Spirit that you should have all if you have any, and that's why it's indivisible. We went over love, joy, and peace, and I was saying this from Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 I was saying that these are not for a moment human characteristics augmented or stimulated at all it's not your love at all you may have a love and I'm sure that you do have capacity to love but this is not what is being spoken of in here it's God in you loving It's God, the Holy Spirit, in you, doing the loving. The Spirit which is given unto us, out from him, as it were, gushes forth the love of God. Not the love for God, but the love of God. God's actual capacity and active energy to love. That's very worthwhile at this point, as I have done in another book than this, I didn't put it in here, to turn aside and see what it is that God loves. Turn to the scripture and find out, for that's the thing I'm going to love when God loves through me. And if he said to Israel, I have loved thee with an everlasting love, 
that I cannot have the love of God rushing forth in me without having an affection for his ancient people. Or the love of souls and everything else. As you come to identify the things that characterize, as objective, characterize the love of God. And then there is joy, peace, and gentleness. Gentleness, which is never weakness, but very, very definite characteristic of God. And goodness. These are all divine characteristics, and they are the manifestation. Now make it very practical for a minute, please, supposing that uh, <coughs> two of us in here could change places with each other, one for me to enter your body and live in you, you enter my body and live in me, immediately the characteristics that are mine would be showing forth in you, your body, and your characteristics would be showing forth here. And you can't have the Holy Spirit of God entering in to live without having the characteristics of God manifest if the way is clear, if it's not blocked by something that hinders him. And so all these characteristics the goodness of God. I point out here in this text that in Romans 5, 7, where the apostle has said, For scarcely for a righteous man would one that dare to die, but peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. A righteous man and a good man, what's the difference? Well, a righteous man might put a widow with her children into the street on the day her rent is due. But a good man might find some other way to get around it and avoid that thing. I was teaching in Massachusetts years ago in Moody School at Mount Hermon. And there was an unwritten law that if the teacher was three minutes late, the class was dismissed automatically. And I was detained downstairs by the principal himself. It was not my fault. And I was really five minutes late. And as I went up the stairs, I expected to meet the, the whole herd of fellows coming down Pell Mill. But I didn't meet them. And I went into the room on the third floor where I was teaching. And there they were all seated as quiet and patient as could be. Then I said, now I want you fellows to tell me the difference between a good man and a righteous man, and I quoted this scripture. Some of them um, made an effort that it, what, the, what they imagined was the difference between a good man and a righteous man. And they wanted me to tell them, I said, well, a righteous man could have left here three minutes after the hour. A good man could sit it out as you did. And I said, I thank you for it. Goodness is an element more than righteousness. Righteousness has the character of exactness and sometimes hard, unyielding. Read about that carefully. Then there is faithfulness. Now the authorized version gives you the word faith, which is which is not a characteristic of God. God does not exercise faith. There's no stretch of the imagination that can make out that God, he might stimulate faith in you, as he does. And if he hadn't, you never would have been saved. For by faith are ye saved through faith, through grace, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. That's saving faith. But faith in the Christian's life is not God's characteristic working through you at all. Faith is faithfulness. And there you have him. Great is thy faithfulness. 
great is thy faithfulness. And when he works through you, you will be faithful too. Then the doctrine, uh, then the characteristic of meekness. Now, fellows, that's about as rare as anything that you can find in the world is the dog is actual meekness. But it's a fruit of God's spirit, the meekness of the spirit. And this meekness of God is reproduced in you. You've not got to make an effort now to be meek. Supposing you did make an effort to be meek, you might make a little progress and then you'd be proud of it and spoil the whole thing. <laughs> no, you can't work out meekness. You can't do it. You can't work out any of these things on the plane in which they are presented to you. They're divine characteristics. These are the attributes and characteristics of God. And you can't do it. No man can do it. No person on earth can do it. But by simply adjustment to him and the filling of the Spirit, then we shall know something of divine love, divine joy, divine peace, divine goodness and faithfulness and meekness. I have known one or two that were meek. I think I've said something here that is worth repeating. That is, meekness is not making yourself out to be less than you are at all. That's not what's required, but and certainly you're not to make yourself out more than you are. That's pride. But take yourself for what you are some of the most dominating men I've ever known have been the outstanding embodiment of meekness. They were masters of assemblies, and yet they were just as meek as anything could ever be. They, carried, they did show forth this, this virtue of God. Now that, there's a long section on that here, as you know. And then comes self-control, uh, temperance. Our authorized version used the word temperance. And the proper word is self-control. Self-control. That you can't do. You cannot do it. But the spirit can do it, and self-control, you will be a kept person. I've been amazed at some of my friends, at the way in which they are kept, and the quiet spirit that, that they manifest in self-control. And it's a divine characteristic. Now, fellows, I'm holding before you a supernatural life. Don't you see it? This is a supernatural life. There's nothing natural about it at all. And I don't want you to be afraid of supernatural things. In the first place, you are a supernatural person. You're born of God. And that didn't happen accidentally. But it was a mighty working of God, and you're born of God. And that's a supernatural result. Now, all of these manifestations of the Spirit, remember we have, we're tracing out certain manifestations which together form what may be called the filling of the Spirit. And I know what the filling of the Spirit is because of these manifestations. At the end of each one, I can stop and ask myself whether I manifest anything like this. Well, do I manifest the nine graces of the fruit of the Spirit? I can't say that I do as I should. And I have to tell my friend in Detroit, as I told you, that I was aiming at that life, but 
I could not, in humility, stand up and say that I've gained it. I have not. I've, I've gained salvation through His grace, yes, but I have not. I have not come to be the ideal person by any means at all. Now, don't be misled by what your friends say to you, and what they and they they speaking in kindness may tell you things about yourself that are not altogether true, and bless your heart, you know they're not true. You know it's not true. And yet you don't like to tell them that they're lying. But you know that they know, you know that it's not true. I like to hear you say it, but I know it isn't true. Now come to the gift on page 215, the doctrine of gifts. First Corinthians chapter 12 is the central passage on this great doctrine. I advise you to study it most carefully. First Corinthians chapter 12. What do we mean by gifts? Natural endowments. Are you gifted in music or in art or in some form of speech? Are you gifted in language? We're not talking about that at all. We're talking about something that uh, that is bestowed upon you. And every Christian has received some gift. Everyone is the object of some gift. Everyone. And they just don't know there is such a thing. As Paul said to the Corinthian church, he came behind in no spiritual gift to that church. You couldn't say that to any church I know anything about today. They wouldn't know what you were talking about. They never heard of it. They don't know a solitary thing about it. What is a gift? Well, I'll tell you. It's God the Holy Spirit doing something through you and using you to do it. Now, that's a very accurately statement. It's God the Holy Spirit doing something through you and using you to do it. It's not you do, doing something by the help of the Spirit. That's the back end too. That isn't it at all. And all this prayer, help, oh Lord, help. Lord, help. Now what about, well, I've got something started that I can't carry. Well, what'd you start it for? I've got into something that I can't get out. Well, what'd you get into it for? Be careful, men. Getting where you have to cry for help. Get where the Spirit does things for you. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we have beginning at verse 4, this context. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Supposing there are now 60 men in this room who are all aiming at Christian work, every one of you aiming at Christian work, and you're going to do something by the power of the Spirit. And if every one of these 50 men go out from here and do 50 different things, diversity of gifts, it will be just this, that it's the one and the same Spirit doing all of it in every one. That's the main thing now. It's produced by the Spirit. There are differences of administration, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operation, but it is the same God that worketh or energizes all in all. The word energizes here now. So you have the Spirit, the Lord, and God, and all working in this mighty energizing work. But the manifestation 
of the Spirit, and that's exactly what it is, a manifestation of the Spirit, supposing to have been given to me to be a teacher, that my ministry under the Spirit was that of a teacher. In fact, Dr. Schofield was very outspoken, and I was a young man, and I had just begun to be acquainted with him. Right here in the city of Dallas, 42 years ago, I suppose it was, he told me, he said, your gift is not the gift of an evangelist. He says you're a pastor and teacher. And then to be perfectly frank, he said, now don't misunderstand me. He said, I'm not saying that you are a teacher. I am saying this, that if you knew anything, you could teach it. <laughs> and I was admonished by that, I tell you. If I knew anything, I could teach it, yes. But the implication was that I didn't know much. And that was after he'd heard me preach for two weeks. <laughs> and I'd suffered all kinds of affliction with the stuff that I'd been preaching. For honestly, I didn't know any better. Nobody had taken any pains to teach me anything. Not at all. This dear man just took me to one side in his study and talked plainly like that to me. But I'd told him beforehand, I said, now, Doctor, we're going to reverse things here this morning. He said, what do you mean? I said, the young man's going to speak first and get out of the way. He said, all right. Well, I said, uh, he said, what do you got to say? I said this, that I have been anticipating you to be faithful with me in this conversation. If you're not, I should be disappointed. I want you to tell me exactly the facts of the case of concerning myself after you've heard me try to preach for two weeks every night. And he was sitting there and he said, well, I will, and he did. He told me exactly how utterly unprepared I was, just spinning out a lot of imaginary things that are not worthy of anybody. Now, this manifestation of the Spirit, supposing my gift were the gift, as he said, the gift of a teacher, then who's going to do the teaching? That's the question. Who's going to do the teaching? Am I going to do it? Is he going to help me do it? I've quit that language. I don't ask him to help me do it. I ask him to do it. To do it. And that's the direct manifestation of the Spirit. And then I can be a rank failure, as I've often been to my own consciousness. But to it. This manifestation of the Spirit is given to every Christian man to be profitable with all. And again, the implication is that you will not be profitable without this manifestation of the Spirit. And I don't think you will either. Now, as sample gifts, not a, con not a complete listing at all because the gifts constitute the things that we are called upon to do. And there are no two of us alike. Therefore, there are no two situations alike. The Spirit is going to work through me in my situation, accomplishing the will of God in my life. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another, the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit, always by the same Spirit. To another, faith, by the same Spirit. To another, the gift of healing, by the same Spirit. And that evidently has passed out, for certain gifts were not to endure. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues to another interpretation of tongues. Now, much of this has evidently been called upon, called to cease. If there be gifts, they shall cease, the apostle said. But all these, now, verse 11, all these are energized 
by one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally on what principle? As he will. Now, what's your, what are you going to do? As he will, not as you will. It's not your choice, it's as he will. God doesn't have two different standards in the present day. One for one who is not a Christian and one for one who is. He doesn't have standards like that. This one, the one standard that's put up to you is for a citizen of heaven. And if you were in heaven today, he couldn't ask you anything anymore than he's asked you. A new commandment in this connection that Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. How much? As I have loved you. He couldn't put anything stiffer than that before you if you were in heaven today. Love one another as I have loved you. Yes, there is the requirement. No, I can't do it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. And the first of these manifestations of the Spirit is what is called the fruit of the Spirit. And that's in nine, summed up in nine words. In Galatians chapter 5, I begin again at verse 16. We've had this once. We shall have it several times. This I say then, walk by means of the Spirit, depending on the Spirit. That's what I've been trying to picture to you. The life of faith of dependence upon the Spirit. Walk by means of the Spirit. The word walk, you know, is the manner of life that you live. The manner of life. And there is nothing more significant than the walk. It's a most significant thing. When you walk, you are constantly inviting a fall. Every step is an incipient fall. You take a step forward, you lift yourself forward with the expectation you're going to bring your foot forward and support yourself then again and again and again. Everyone is a fall. Now, if for chance when I lurch forward, I have uh, caught my foot and can't bring it forward, then what? Well, I know what, I, what happens if I can't bring my foot forward, then the walk is broken and I fall. Every step of every day is a walk. It's a continual hurling yourself onto the onto the spirit, beautifully expressed in the little hymn of Major Whittles. Moment by moment, I'm kept in his love. Moment by moment, I light from above. Now, in the early days of the church, we used to sing safely through another week. God has brought us on our way. And we thought of the Christian life as from Sabbath to Sabbath, you know. Then Jude's hymn came out. Uh, day by day his sweet voice calls me. And then another one came, I need thee every hour. And then came Major Whittle's incomparable hymn, Moment by moment I'm kept in his love. There's your progress, there's your life. Moment by moment I'm kept in his love. If by means of the Spirit you're walking, that is depending upon the Spirit, ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Spirit is contrary to the flesh and the flesh to the Spirit. 
verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. They are manifest too. An awful list. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, adultery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the such like. All of this belongs to the flesh, and the flesh is capable of it. I can't tell you uh, more emphatically than that, that the flesh is capable of all that's in that horrible list. Then in verse 22, by contrast, but the fruit of the Spirit, when the Spirit manifests himself, it will not be the manifestation of the flesh. When the flesh manifests itself, it's here in these awful words. But the fruit of the Spirit is summed up in nine beautiful words, and this has been said to be the shortest life of Christ that was ever written. What does it mean when it Paul says, for me to live is Christ, to manifest Christ, and here is the Christ to be manifested. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance, self-control. Against this there is no law, no power can prevail against this, the fruit of the Spirit, when it's wrought by the Spirit. I have given in the text here a quotation from Dr. Schofield from his Bible on this connection and uh, that I would have you read carefully as well as what I have written. Now it's the fruit, the singular, not plural, fruit of the Spirit. When Calma Morgan came on this, he tried to explain why it was a the singular, the fruit of the Spirit, instead of plural, when there were nine distinct gracious names. And he said the first one was the all-important one, and the, all the rest of them were subdivisions of it. And he tried to work that out, but it utterly failed. Of course it failed. Why is it called in the singular, the fruit of the Spirit? Because it makes it constitutes one whole. These nine constitute one indivisible whole. The Spirit is not going to do one of them and leave eight of them undone, or leave you do eight of them and leave one of them undone. If he does one, he'll do all of this manifestation in the light. It's like a cluster of most beautiful grapes laid on the table of a king for his refreshing Now, I had, years ago, occasion in a series of meetings to speak nine times, and I took each time one of these nine graces to develop it under just what I'm trying to tell you now, that is the fruit of the Spirit. And when I went through the whole New Testament on each one of these, I found so very, very much to strengthen all that I'm trying to say to you. I have time, of course, to go over those nine outlines now, but I'm going to touch the first one. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Not human love at all. It's not your love, but it's the love of God working through you. The word love of God shed abroad in your heart, out from the Spirit which is given unto you. In Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, I'm quoting on this. And verse 5. 
Hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God, not love for God, it isn't love for God, it's God's love, God's active love, is literally gushing forth, gushing forth through you, out from the Spirit which is given unto you. Now you cannot account for what you call a missionary spirit, a willingness to go into the darkest place of the earth and sacrifice and suffer. You can't account for it on any other ground than the sacrifice which was in Christ is being reproduced in you. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. I'm very anxious, boys, to have the truth stick in your mind so you see it wherever you find it and recognize it. First John chapter 2. Verse 15, love not the cosmos world. If any man love the world, now we've just been talking about this cosmos world. If any man love the cosmos world, the love of the Father, not love for the Father, but the Father's love is not in him. The Father's love is not passing through him. I say without hesitation, men, my estimation, if you want to drink the wine of heaven, just experience the love of God passing through your heart. Just experience the love of God passing through your heart. Now the last verse of the high priestly prayer, in the 17th of John, when Jesus prayed there, And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. That love may be in them. Now, an illustration, I'll take time for it. It is my privilege to meet and know the lady who founded the Door of Hope, Mrs. Whittemore, the Door of Hope for Fallen Girls in New York, out on 64th Street. I knew Mrs. Whittemore very well, a most godly woman. She and her husband were members of an Episcopal church in New York, and just as remote from anything spiritual as anything could be. They lived along on 14th Street when it was the residential part of New York. And uh, they had guests one night, a man and his wife to dinner. And after they'd finished the dinner, the question was how they'd spend the evening. Didn't have movies at that time. So they decided to get the coach out and drive down through Mulberry Street and see the slum people just for the spectacle of it, Mulberry Bend. So they drove down through there, and old Jerry McCauley's mission on Water Street is right there, and they somehow were inclined to leave the carriage, and all four of them went in that night to Jerry McCauley's mission. And when Jerry had finished preaching, among the bombs and the harlots that went up in front at his invitation, Mr. and Mrs. Whittemore went up and knelt down with the rest. I don't know whatever became of Mr. Whittemore, but Mrs. Whittemore became one of the greatest powers we ever had in this country for good. Marvelous. And she founded the Door of Hope. And then she would go, usually on Saturday night, down into that district and walk around there and contact the women that were there 
and invite them to come to the door of hope. One night she went down into a sub cellar and she contacted a girl named Delia who had just come out of a drunken fight and there's a great cut in her face, a terrible and awful creature. And he, she asked her to come to the door of hope, invited her to come, told her she could come and be w welcome. And before morning, Delia made up her mind she was going to go. And she got out early in the morning, and a number of the denizens of that district, she had told them what she was going to do. And they went with her and gave her money enough for a streetcar fare and put her on the car and said to her, stick to it, stick to it. And she went up and she appeared there just about daylight and rang the doorbell and the matron came to the door and Delia said, a woman gave me this address last night and invited me to come here. Well, she said, come in, sit down. She took her into the reception room, told her to sit down. She went upstairs and woke up Mrs. Whittemore and said, the most awful creature down there in the reception room has just come in, said you invited her last night. Well, Mrs. Whittemore got out of bed and put a robe on and went down into the reception room. Now, naturally, a woman with the background and taste of Mrs. Whittemore would have sat on one side of the room and left Delia alone on the other. Instead of that, she went to Delia and kissed her first on one cheek and then on the other, back and forth from kissing her from one cheek to the other. And Delia couldn't understand it, of course. But finally, she just was overcome, and she went down in a heap on the floor, and Mrs. Whittemore right down beside her, and Delia was moaning and saying, Oh, you've got something that I want. You've got something that I want. Before she got up from her knee, off that floor, she was saved. Now Delia lived one year, only 12 months after that, and then died. In that time, she had the record of leading 1,500 people to Christ. Now, what was it in Mrs. Whittemore that could literally kiss that Delia into the kingdom of God? What was it? The love of God literally shed abroad in her heart. Now, I've heard Mrs. Whittemore tell this incident myself with tears streaming down her face. And it's all in a little book. I don't know whether you will ever having to fall upon it or not, but it's entitled Delia, the Bluebird of Mulberry Den. I have a copy of the book myself and prize it very highly. I doubt if it's in the library. But if you ever see it, get it and have it. Delia, the Bluebird of Mulberry Den. And I've told that story just because I wanted to illustrate what I mean by the love of God gushing forth it's God's love. It's not her love. Not It's not Mrs. Whittemore's love stimulated and strengthened at all. It's God's love that is gushing forth out from the spirit which is given unto her. And nobody in the world would, would acknowledge that more fully than Mrs. Whittemore herself in her day. Then there was a man named Hop Hadley. He was lame and always walked with this kind of a hopping step. And Hop was, this, was the next superintendent after Jerry McCauley in the Water Street Mission. <coughs> I knew Hop very well and was often in the mission preaching myself. And he, he was laughed at all the time because any bum could go in there and get money from him, get help from him. Because he he loved them so. And they thought that they were working him, but sooner or later the love of God in Hop's heart would break him down, and they'd have to give up and come in and accept the Savior. 
It was a most marvelous illustration of what I'm saying. Do you want to love souls? Fellas, that isn't a native thing at all. That isn't in your constitution to love souls. Never. You'll never love souls. But when God's love passes through your heart, the love that gave Jesus to die for you on the cross, when that love passes through your heart, then you love souls. But never before. Never. Never. Now it's just up to you to have the fruit of the Spirit, with the first of it being the shedding abroad of the love of God in the heart. Then the next is joy and peace. And these are things that you can't manufacture or control. You can't manufacture love, you can't manufacture joy or peace. They are imparted things. You can't do it. Of all the attempts that you'll ever try to make would be to try to love somebody when you don't love them. You can't do it. And bless your heart, you can't stop doing it when you do love them. You can't do that because it's out of your control. You can't give yourself joy. Now, don't try to put on a ten-cent smile and appear joyful whether you are or not. Joy is the presence of Christ. My joy I give unto you, he said. And they knew what he was talking about when he said, my joy, because they'd lived with him and they knew about it. Now, the Catholics have played an awful trick on us. For they are responsible for almost all the imaginary pictures of Christ. And they've all of them vied with each other to see who could paint the most dismal, most awful, sorrowful face that could ever be pictured. They can't think of anything only a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But he said, my joy I give unto you. And for the joy that was set before him, the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame. Did the Lord have joy? Little children ran to him, and I don't believe that little children would ever run to him without there being joy there. His joy is to be your experience, and his peace, my peace, I give unto you. His peace is an experience, and it's the peace of God shed abroad in your heart just as the love of God is shed abroad and we're dismissed for the moment.